with you. So I'm going to talk about something that I think we all understand. How many of you drove a car to arrive here tonight? That's a pretty broad. Now, some of you might be city dwellers, OK? And that's good. We'll talk about that, too. But the fact is that transportation mobility is uh, an integral part of, of our lives, whether it's our personal cars, or whether it's uh, public transportation, or whether it's your feet. So I'm going to talk about um, some trends. You know, as Vince said, I work for Ohio State University. We have an organization called Center for Automotive Research. It's on Kinnear Road on the West Campus. Uh, and it um, doesn't look like much from the front. It's a low brick building, but actually goes quite a ways in the back. And there are all <coughs> kinds of cool things, uh, unusual vehicles. And my colleague, Umit Osguner, spoke a couple of uh, sessions ago last summer about the future of self-driving cars. That's one of the areas uh, we work in. I'll talk about different things. And I'm going to basically talk about mobility uh, it really is a universal aspiration. It, uh, it really means personal freedom. You know, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and, you know, I, my driver's license came to me, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the mid-1970s, right? So that was still the days of uh, when kids like me thought of cars as sort of the biggest symbol of freedom. Things are different today. You know, the new generations think about it differently. But the idea of being autonomous and of having access to work, to entertainment, to you know, leisure time is, is very important to all of us. <clears throat> but I do have to set the stage by talking a little bit about some background that has to do with energy, because moving yourselves does take energy, right? So I thought that I would start with this uh, color chart. I know you can't see it back there, but I'm going to go by color code here. And so first of all, how much energy did the United States consume in 2013? The data for 2014 is not quite out yet. Give me another month or two and I'll have it. But the answer is 97.4 quads. So first question is, what is a quad? How many of you know what a quad is in that context? OK, a quad stands for, pay attention, quadrillion BTUs, as in British thermal units. So quadrillion, so that other, you might want to pause for a second and say, how many zeros in a quadrillion? That's a lot. So that's how many BTUs we used, almost 100 BTUs. So round this up to one, uh, 100 quadrillion BTUs, round this up to 100, and it turns out that 35% of it came from petroleum. How about that? Natural gas is number two, about 26%, coal 18%. You go back five or six years, and those numbers were actually flipped around. So we're using more natural gas, less coal. So let's see, petroleum, coal, natural gas. These are all fossil fuels, right? OK. Then what's n number um, four? Uh, number four is this red one here, which happens to be nuclear, about 8 9%. That's where we get uh, uh, power. After nuclear, here's the big surprise. This wasn't true, again, five, 10 years ago. But biomass is now responsible for about 4.5% of our energy consumption. And then you go into uh, hydro. It's been constant at about 2.5% for a very long time because we've used whatever hydroelectric power capabilities we have in the country. And then wind. Wind is, is one of the big surprises. You look at wind 10 years ago, zero. Now it's 1.6% growing very rapidly. How about solar? Well, it's 0.3%. Uh, five years ago, it was maybe 0.03%. So solar has a long way to go. And geothermal is 0.2. OK, so what do we get from this? That fossil fuels dominate. And when you look at the end uses, residential, commercial, industrial, transportation, OK, transportation is almost completely fed by this thick green line, which is petroleum. So the point is that transportation is something like 96% dependent on petroleum today. We all wish that we could drive solar-powered cars. But wishing doesn't make it happen. And some of the things, uh, uh, some of the reasons have to do with politics uh, and economics. And some of them have to do with engineering. 
So that is already kind of a shocking picture if you hadn't thought about it before. You know, 96% of transportation is incredible. 96% of the energy used in transportation comes from petroleum, and the numbers are huge. Now, look at projections. This is where liquids, liquids, liquid fuels, you're really talking primarily about petroleum. Um, the perceived expected growth is going to be significant in the coming years. Why? Well, guess what? China wants to have a transportation environment that is similar to the one in the United States, and so does South America and India and, Brazil, you know, and, and Russia. And, and so the point is that if the rest of the world ends up adopting the model that we have used for um, approximately a century, demand for liquid fuels will continue to increase. And most of the increase in liquid fuels will have to do with transportation. So let's do a little simple quiz. I really do want an answer, okay? The previous questions may have been rhetorical. This one is not. How many cars do you think are in circulation on the road in the world today? Spit some numbers out. Someone said one billion. We have a winner. I, didn't have a pr I don't have a prize. I should have brought some door. Actually, one billion is a pretty good approximation, okay? And if you look at projections for the penetration of uh, vehicles in the Far East, in South America, and in growing economies around the world, projections are that by circa 2050, we would have two billion cars around the world. Personally, I think we have a bit of a problem with one billion. I don't know what we're gonna do with two billion at least not with two billion cars like the ones we drive today. So, next quiz, what car is that? Model T. Model T. The Model T is the car that created the auto industry as we know it today. It created a lot of employment, it created uh, uh, a, a pay scale for factory workers that actually enabled them to buy Ford Model Ts. I mean, Henry Ford was no fool, okay? So 100 years of petroleum, what can we do if we wanted to move away from petroleum? Well, we all know that biofuels are an alternative, but there are several aspects of biofuels that work against them. The economics uh, are one, uh, especially if petroleum continues to be as cheap as it is today, uh, it really does cost more than $60 a barrel to make uh, uh, ethanol. And how do you make ethanol? You know, what to, or how do you make diesel fuel? You know, what, what is the feedstock that is right? And my personal contention is that any feedstock that competes with food production, you know, do I grow food for people or fuel, uh, you know, that's kind of a tough problem to to deal with. If you live in Ohio, which I think you all do, and you haven't, and you're not fed up with hearing about natural gas, okay, I, tell me how you did it. I, I, maybe I'm old fashioned, I still read the paper every day, okay. But natural gas is something that is being projected as being an interesting alternative, and it is. You know that CODA, our transit authority has gone, will is converting to 100% natural gas powered buses. It is going to take about a decade for that to happen, but they're moving on their plan. They did it strictly for economic reasons. That's, um, you know, the bottom line is what drove them. And natural gas is good. It uh, has lower CO2 emissions than uh, diesel fuel. Uh, it's cleaner, you know, so there are good things. But natural gas is still a fossil fuel and I am not going to go into the environmental debate, but I, I certainly would be, am concerned about making sure that any horizontal drilling that we do to extract natural gas is done with a lot of care for the environment. So electricity, electric cars, holy cow, you know, Tesla is, uh, has made quite a name for itself and just about every major auto company today sells an electric car. So, these pictures are so nice. That's a Tesla parked in front of my office, the original Roadster. Someone loaned it to me for four days. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, every, every access ramp on the freeway is like a license to, uh, to have fun, okay? Uh, it, is, it, it's, it is exactly like that. Um, then it took charging overnight on 110 was a bit of a challenge. But, uh, so you see all these beautiful pictures, solar panels in a... Uh, beautiful green field of uh, windmills, you know, with the clouds behind. Reality is that electricity doesn't come by itself. Uh, it doesn't grow on trees. It has to be produced in some fashion. And this is another color chart, and I want to point out to you that the color yellow represents coal. 
So 50% of the electricity produced in the US is generated by burning coal. So that electric car, gosh, you know, an electric car in South Dakota is actually probably producing more CO2 than a gasoline or diesel fuel car in South Dakota. Not necessarily true in uh, California, where you have a lot of hydro and nuclear, for example. So it's important to understand that electricity, its, uh, it's uh, CO2 emissions and environmental impact are a very regional thing. This is the average for the US. Now you go to Australia, and Australia is 60% coal. You go to China, wow, almost 80% coal. You go to France, you almost don't see any yellow because France made a strategic decision a long time ago, and they're 80% nuclear. So an electric car in France makes perfect sense if what you want to do is reduce CO2 emissions. Switzerland is another good country for uh, electric cars. An electric car in China or in South Dakota, I hope there's no one from South Dakota here, I don't mean to offend anyone, but an electric car in one of those regions of the world really is a different story. So we have to think about this. By the way, if you're curious, uh, with this mix, uh, nuclear, uh, hydro, natural gas, coal in the US, on average, does an electric car produce lower CO2 emissions than a modern day gasoline car? And the answer is yes. Even with all this coal we burn, that's still true. Uh, but uh, it's not as good as we would like it to be because if that electricity were made from renewable sources uh, with low or zero carbon emissions, the world would be a much better place. That's a discussion for another day. And if all else fails, I have a proposal for a transportation system that is biofueled. We still do have to deal with emissions though. So what are we going to do? I had to set up the energy thing, because if you don't, don't really focus on the fact that moving yourself, whether it's by train, by car, by bus, we turn the volume down a bit here, by train, by car, by bus, um, you know, by, well, bicycles are good, by motorcycle, uh, you're going to have to uh, respect the fact that we're still largely dependent on fossil fuels. So, Step number one, it is easy and you know, attractive to think of revolutionizing everything. But an auto industry that took 100 years to get where it is today, and it's in a pretty good place actually, they employ a lot of advanced technology in a very intelligent way, um, you don't change it from one day to the next. So the first step in improving our current dependency on uh, fossil fuels is to go through a series of steps that are going to cause our vehicles to use less energy. Weight reduction, improved efficiency, electrification, the use of alternative fuels, and reduction in vehicle miles traveled, VMT, vehicle miles traveled. So I always like to give this example. Every morning, if you're a commuter, you are, and Columbus, by the way, is a delightful city to live in because we have no traffic in Columbus. If you don't believe me, visit Beijing, okay. But you see you're down 315, 270. What do you see? A sea of cars, each of them with one person surrounded by a large mass of metal, plastic, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So re reducing vehicle miles traveled, if, you were, if each car had two persons instead of one, that'd be 50% reduction in fuel consumption. Wow, what a revolutionary concept. So I'm hoping that through all kinds of great technology, we'll get to things like car sharing, ride sharing, in a much more effective way in the future. But nonetheless, if we're going to continue to build cars, why not make them lighter? Well, there is a reason for that. Cars, first of all, today's cars are already about as light as they can be within the cost structure that we can afford. But they're still made largely of stamped steel. Uh, there's a lot of plastic in cars. Those of you who are old enough like me to remember the old days cars when everything was steel realize that today there's an awful lot of plastic in cars. There is also magnesium, aluminum, okay? You might have heard about the new Ford F-150 with, with an aluminum body, which is an industry first. But why is it so difficult to move to lighter weight materials? 
Even if you set aside cost, you're not going to make a car out of titanium, okay? It's too expensive. But in addition to expensive, there is also the, the issue of forming and joining it. Stamping steel is so darn easy to do, and we have a, a huge enterprise that knows how to do that very well. In fact, Ohio is kind of the hotbed, the, the, the um, uh, original uh, home of metal forming. We're famous here in Ohio for that. So you start going to things like magnesium, um, um, ceramics, uh, composite materials, carbon fiber, and forming them and joining them actually turns out to be a lot harder than stamping and welding steel. So there are a lot of colleagues of mine around the world, not just at Ohio State, who are looking at the science of ma uh, alternative materials and multi-material structures. Improved vehicle efficiencies. I'm going to talk a little bit about something that I understand a little better than uh, the uh, materials uh, uh, technologies, which is uh, uh, improving the technology of the vehicle from uh, 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 you know, the vehicle perspective. One is, can I make this old concept of internal combustion, the internal combustion engine, can I make it more efficient? How do I do that? And there are many ways of doing it. And today, if you buy a new car and you don't have a turbocharged direct injection engine, take it back to the dealer and get another one that is turbocharged and direct injected because the technology we have in engines today has improved the efficiency of these engines unbelievably. It really phenomenal what we've done. And, um, but, how do you make these improvements? And there is still a lot of room for more improvements. And a lot of it has to do with computational technology, the ability to model things like these. When you spray fuel directly in the combustion chamber, uh, not every injection is the same. You're breaking up this fuel stream into microscopic particles that might be, you know, maybe uh, 10, 20, uh, uh, microns in diameter and then you have to mix them with the fuel and, uh, and ignite this mixture, extremely complicated. One of the great advances today that uh, we have um, uh, been able to benefit from, I should be able to do this, yes I will, there you go. What you're looking at here is a 3D computational fluid dynamic picture of natural gas and air mixing in an engine and uh, that's a real model of an actual um, uh, intake system in an engine. Today, we have the ability to compute and come up with computational models of very accurate predictions of how fuel and air will mix, how they will combust, what kind of exhaust gases they will form, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this will continue. Engines used to be made based on experience and a lot of past know-how. Today, Things are really designed in the computer first, and the goal is to continue to reduce the experimental metal engine uh, uh, phase of the development so that you do most of the development in the computer and you get to the experimental testing at a stage when you're already 90% uh, there. What this enables us to do is to introduce new technologies in engines much more rapidly than was possible before. You know, an engine change 20, 30 years ago, an engine program change in an auto company was a five to 10 year deal. Today, it is possible, this is done mostly in racing applications, but you can go from clean sheet to a, an engine in a race car in six months. So this means that as people invent better injectors or come up with new fuels, we can very rapidly introduce these technologies into, into the automobile. Now, vehicle electrification. I always thought this expression was strange. Electrification makes me think of the electric chair. But <laughs> the fact is that, let me say that the introduction of electricity is an additional energy source for a vehicle is actually a very good idea. And, um, we all know it's there. I mean, Toyota sold its first Prius in this country in 1999, so it's been around for 15 years now. What is happening is that through vehicle electrification, whether it's a straight ahead hybrid or a plug-in hybrid or a battery electric car, we're able to take advantage of the much greater efficiency of electric motors relative to internal combustion engines. I'll give you some numbers. Today, if you have a really, really, really good internal combustion engine, uh, its peak efficiency in energy conversion is about 40%. Yeah, a little higher for diesel, a little lower for gasoline, but take 40% as a number for the peak efficiency. 
a really good electric machine can give you a peak efficiency of about 97%. Okay. So great, you know, electricity is a good fuel in principle because the machines that convert it are very efficient. But there is a fundamental problem. You have to store electricity somewhere. And storing electricity in batteries is something that we're used to doing in our consumer electronic devices. But what you may not have thought about is that if you took what you pay for the lithium battery in your cell phone, and you multiply that to the size of the battery pack that would be good for a car, you'd pay $100,000 for that battery. Okay. Now, I'm making the number up, but the order of magnitude is probably pretty accurate, pretty close. So the point is, energy storage technology is one of those game changers. If we somehow could find a way to um, bring the cost of the batteries down and improve their performance and life, uh, electrification of vehicles would become uh, might much more likely. Yes, we need to worry about a charging infrastructure, and I talked already about low carbon electricity. We need to figure out how to make low carbon electricity as well. But I'm going to give you a couple of words about some of the big challenges with electrochemical energy storage. And um, the idea is that you're trying to achieve a set of objectives. If you've ever seen this kind of spider charts, they call them, uh, they look like a spider web, OK? You're trying to get specific power and specific energy. You want the power to accelerate and the energy to last for a long time, so you have extended range. Of course, you want the cost to be low, and you want the cycle and calendar life to be as long as possible. Why calendar life? Because um, batteries age even when they sit on a shelf by themselves. There's a natural process of aging. So here is the story about uh, electrochemistry, aging, and batteries. We are electrochemical systems, we human beings, and we age, don't we? Because these chemical processes in our body that take place continuously at some point kind of get tired, you know, and our muscles don't respond the same way, et cetera, et cetera. Well, a battery is an electrochemical system, and it ages as well. And the behavior of a battery is a very complex uh, uh, affair because you have multiple things interacting in it. Sure. Chemistry, right? Uh, you look at a battery, there is a, an electrochemical couple that determines that your basic voltage for a lead acid cell is 2 volts, uh, for a nickel metal hydride is 1.4 volts, for a lithium batteries it could be 3 to 4 volts, and so on. So there is chemistry, but you also have to deal, of course, with the electrical connections, and more important than that, thank you, uh, um, with the thermal side. Batteries' worst enemy are extreme temperatures. At very cold temperatures, there are irreversible processes that cause the battery to <clears throat> age dramatically. And if you have continuous exposure at very high temperature, different processes cause the battery to age as well. And you really can't recover from it. Unfortunately, it's like us human beings, you know? You can't really get younger. You can try to slow down the process, but, uh, but that's, uh, we're stuck with it. And in addition to that, if you want to understand the behavior of batteries, you have to work on so many different scales. Today, the electrodes that make up, the, the materials that make up the electrodes in a battery, the cathode and the anode, are nanoscale particles, literally, nanometer scale. But then you assemble these things into big long sheets and you fold them together or roll them up and you make a cell. And of course, as current goes through the cell, it generates heat. Okay, And so you need to dissipate this heat somehow. You don't want the cell to be too hot. But then what do you do? You take a bunch of these cells and you stick them close to one another into a module. And then you put six modules and make a battery pack. There are system integration issues that are very important. So understanding how batteries age and how to integrate all of these things and how to manage them requires understanding from basic physics and chemistry all the way to large-scale system integration. I find it to be a fascinating topic. And uh, uh, there is a lot of work uh, involved in this. And um, uh, what I'm going to do, time for a break, OK? This was kind of high-speed <laughs> conversation. We're going to look at an application of batteries in, uh, in uh, an unusual vehicle.
car has been, uh, uh, it started as a side activity where I was uh, just the advisor to a group of students, but today this car has become uh, a symbol of uh, uh, two things that are very important to me. Educating young people, creating a new generation of engineers that thinks in a different way, and also the excitement of racing, of speed, and of doing it with alternative technologies, with what is going to be the future of the automobile. Fast, electric, exciting. For me, the Venturi Jamie Canton is the fastest electric vehicle in the world and the future of racing. There's uh, so much of an investment in time and funding that goes into a project like this that um, I, I'm focusing on doing what I should be doing so that we have the best chance of getting a record, you know. Uh, I just want to make sure I do my job. The Venturi is jamais content is, uh, is for me an historical car. It's for sure an electrical car. And I really believe it's a magical car. Like this one here might be a good one, guys. 286 miles an hour. Hey, yeah, this is a good one. He's running pretty fast now. 291.947 miles per hour. For the kilo, 292.142. Congratulations. Uh, 320.7. Oh! <laughs> the team has achieved today a, a fantastic performance, 495 kilometers per hour average. That's a that's a world record. That's really amazing. I'm I'm extremely pleased. So I wanted to thank everybody, and uh, are we ready to come back again here in Bonneville to to go faster? I'm sure. So that was 2010, and you know the video is a little bit uh, dated. But since that day, we've been working on the next generation car, and um, we actually have already tested it. Last summer, we were on the Bonneville Salt Flats, and the next goal for the third generation uh, vehicle, we've been doing this for about 15 years, is actually 400 miles per hour on electric power. So it's kind of a crazy number, right? Uh, and if you look at the history of the automobiles, only 10 cars have gone faster, wheel-powered cars, not jet-powered cars, okay, have gone faster than 400 miles per hour. So you say, this is totally crazy. Well, it is, of course. <clears throat> it's the most insane project I've ever been involved in. But uh, we are uh, pushing the technology of uh, uh, electric power converters, inverters, batteries. What these batteries do, they only run for about two minutes. But we run them at uh, current rates that uh, you know, manufacturers say, okay, Go ahead and see what you can do, but we didn't think it was possible. So you have to think about cooling and about all kinds of other interesting things. So um, I showed this just you know, to sort of give a little break, but also because we're very proud of what we've done. And we believe that some of the things we're doing are going to find their way in commercial technology in the next several years. Now to close, I'll talk a little bit about urbanization and uh, congestion because the world is actually experiencing a significant trend in urbanization, a trend that started a long time ago. Now, here is another quiz. Where is that? Very good. That was the armory, so that's good. So you're right around the oval, okay? And um, what day of the week was that? It must have been a Saturday. That's football day, day okay, it is. Parking on a football Saturday at Ohio State, they tell me 1917, okay? So uh, it's from the OSU archives. My point is that congestion and parking problems are not a novelty around here, okay? So in fact, 
uh, it is estimated by, that by 2030, which, gosh, it's not that far away, is it? By 2030, 60% of the population of the world will live in urban areas. That's a trend that has been ongoing. And you know, it makes sense uh, because that's where jobs are, that's where employment is. And um, you know, I have had over the last few years the opportunity to travel to China uh, a couple of times a year because I'm part of a China-USA program uh, uh, that is focused on clean vehicles. So I've gotten to see rural areas, urban areas in China, and it's pretty apparent there that the difference in quality of life between the rural and the urban parts of uh, uh, the country is immense. And its urbanization is moved probably as fast in China as anywhere else in the world. But you see these big disks. The big disks in red are cities that are more than 10 million people. And they're growing and growing. So what do you do in these mega cities? Well, there you go. That was my point about uh, commuters, right? Um, so when I say you don't know traffic if you haven't been in a traffic jam in Beijing, personal experience, OK? Um, so what's urban mobility going to be? What do we have to think about? And uh, this is a space in which there are opportunities for innovation in so many ways you have no idea. I work with people who uh, um, work in industrial design. Uh, obviously anything that has to do with apps that can connect you to information and knowledge that can make you operate more efficiently, whether it's uh, ride sharing or parking, whatever it happens to be. All of these things give us phenomenal opportunities, and I'll give you an example in a minute. So he here is really some of the um, challenges or opportunities for transportation system. First of all, personal versus mass transportation. I've also taken um, the subway in Beijing. And I stopped at one point, I was in line waiting to get on a train, and the trains were coming in one a minute with so many cars, huge, and everyone is about as full of people as can be. And so I started doing some counting, scratching my head thinking, this is just one line of the subway. So this, uh, it was 8 a.m., and you start estimating how many people go into the city by public transit. Without that public transportation system, you could not uh, operate in that city. Car sharing, as I said, I think that that's a great opportunity. And you know we're doing it. We now have these car to go on campus. Uh, and um, they didn't exist just two or three years ago. My daughter is a sophomore at OSU. And she says she loves it. She's a member. And she uses it when she needs it. And she has absolutely no interest in having her own car. Okay, so that definitely a trend in the, in the new, younger generations. You want vehicles that have low to zero emissions. And how about parking? Okay, parking is a real issue. I repeat, we live in Columbus. This is like heaven. You have no idea. I grew up, so I grew up in another traffic challenge country called Italy. I grew up in Rome. Parking in Rome, it's, you know, you have to smile um, at what Romans do to find the parking spot, okay? And uh, so, but basically what the city has been doing for the last decade or so, successfully, I have to say, has been to discourage people from using cars. Uh, increasing use of information systems and, you know, why not telecommuting and virtual presence? I, last December 31st, I closed a project with Honda uh, Research and Development in Japan. And, uh, you know, we met physically over the course of a two and a half year project. We met twice in person. I went to Japan once and the folks from uh, Honda came to Columbus once. The rest of the time we were just doing video conferences. Slightly inconvenient for us because it was night for us and eight in the morning in, uh, in Tochigi, but still, you can do a lot. Um, and finally, vehicle intelligence and autonomy. So my good friend Umi talked to you about self-driving cars, so I won't say anything about this other than the fact that I have stolen some pictures from him. But I just want to give you an example of something that he and I actually worked on together, which is this cloud computing environment in which, imagine this now, you have a car that can communicate with computers in the cloud that serve as geographical information servers. Uh, you may have maps, all kinds of data, whatever you want to access. So Google Maps, a geographical server. And then you have a computer that is dedicated exclusively to solving complex optimization algorithms. What do you do then? The car is communicating frequently its location. And you know its intent if you have a navigation system and you entered its destination. So what do you do then? So we did an experiment. The, the question was, 
What would happen if, as the car is going, if you used information that is available about the geography, traffic conditions, weather, you know, everything you can possibly uh, um, uh, have access to, what, would you, what could you do if you were not constrained by the limited power of the onboard computers in the car, which after all are little microprocessors. There's lots of them, but they're not particularly powerful. So the idea was, can we, knowing where the car is going, predict what it would have to do in order to use the minimum amount of energy to go from point A to point B while respecting a time window? Because, of course, we understand that you could crawl for you know, three hours and consume very little fuel, but you didn't want to spend three hours to get to point B. So given time as a constraint, what can you do? Well, what we uh, <coughs> developed was a system in which um, the driver would receive a simple form of advice. You're driving along and you are receiving, the computer is continuously solving a series of short horizon optimization problems and sending back to you instructions as to what velocity you should follow. And with a very simple interface in our experimental vehicle, we did this work with Ford, the interface is you see a red light means slow down, green light you can speed up, and if the screen is white, it's just a little LCD screen. If it's white, you're doing fine. Just stay within that speed window. What happens then is we experimented with different routes. So this is Columbus. This is 315. This is 270, right? And, uh, and so the idea was to try a highway type route. And what we found is that if you follow the directions, you can get order of 13% improvement in fuel economy. Wow. The auto industry would kill today for 13% improvement in fuel economy because the CAFE regulations, the corporate average fuel economy standards, are pushing fuel economy to increase by about 2% a year. That's a huge number. Okay? Then we tried in, on a more sort of city type route uh, in Dearborn uh, around uh, the Ford campus. And in city traffic, you get similar results where maybe you have 7, 8, 9% improvement in fuel economy. These are spectacular things. And I wanted to show you, I picked on Diana, who's a longtime friend who works at Ford, who was one of the drivers we selected. We did testing with lots of people. And here's how it works. Red is the advised speed. So that's the one that is computed in the cloud through some optimization algorithm that says, yes, I know that there is a stop sign there. I know that there will be a traffic light. I know that it's 3 p.m. on a Tuesday, and so the average traffic flow velocity is this. So with all those constraints, you solve the optimization problem, and you should drive like the red line. Now, the blue is what Diana did before being instructed. The black, she's a very good follower, OK? There was some other guy who was not, uh, John was not as good as Diana, OK? But if you follow directions, she did pretty well, actually. And the result was something close to 10% fuel economy improvement. So now, this is one car. You start asking yourself the question, OK, so now we have uh, hundreds of thousands of cars in a region that are driving at the same time. How much cloud computing capacity do I need to calculate, you, you know, to optimize velocity for each of them? And how do I make all these things interact with one another intelligently? Because you also have vehicles that could assist you in what you're trying to do or impede what you're trying to do. So this is not, this can be viewed as a local problem where vehicle to vehicle communication, sort of local platooning of vehicles could help, but it's also a global system problem. So we work on these things with traffic engineers, uh, urban planners. We recently have created an informal sustainable mobility network at Ohio State where people ranging from public policy to the civil engineering transportation experts to car people like us are working together. And don't forget about the human element. Yes, vehicles uh, have increasing degrees of autonomy. Uh, someday we may have vehicles that will be fully autonomous part of the time. Uh, may, I, you know, vehicles that are fully autonomous all the time in very special circumstances. But you're always going to have to deal with human decision making. So subjects such, such as human factors, which in the end, uh, it's uh, cognitive human factors is basically psychology, okay, uh, are extremely important. And we have at Ohio State a driving simulator that allows us to actually work with industry partners to help them understand the human interaction with the vehicle in realistic settings. So tomorrow's cars, 
Chips will be driving it, uh, will be sharing it, and uh, I suspect that uh, there will be opportunities over the next decades, not only for the automotive engineers, but for anyone who has a sense of uh, innovation and ideas related to technology, information uh, uh, technology, computing technology, to uh, make a contribution to changing the car. And so I just make a little plug for our Center for Automotive Research. We've been at it since 1991, and uh, we've been located on the West Campus since 1996, and uh, we're happy to be a small part of what we think is the transformation of mobility. So I'm happy to open this up to questions. Thank you. So it's a good question. And um, hydrogen, when you look at it as a fuel, um, once you have the hydrogen in a fuel cell or in an internal, even in an internal combustion engine, uh, the byproducts in terms of emissions are negligible. Uh, from a carbon perspective, uh, there is no carbon in it, right? So no CO2. And from other emission species, yeah, you could make some oxides of nitrogen, but those things can be worked out. So super clean. The problem with hydrogen is that it's an energy vector. It's not actually a fuel. And so you have to make the hydrogen. So hydrogen is difficult to store and transport because it's the smallest molecule, right? Uh, so there are some challenges uh, related to that. And it is a gaseous fuel, so you have to compress it at high pressure to get enough of it. But the fundamental problem is where hydrogen comes from. And today, in the US, most of the hydrogen that is produced comes from uh, methane. So we reform, steam reform methane. Methane is CH4. You strip the C out, and you're left with H2. Well, the C that you strip out ten becomes CO2. So tomorrow, it is would be interesting to see if hydrogen produced uh, from uh, carbon-free sources uh, could be a viable fuel. I'll give you my opinion. I think hydrogen-powered uh, vehicles are always going to be a niche uh, uh, because um, it's difficult to transport. You can't put hydrogen in a pipeline. You kind of have to produce it locally. So it will be part of the mix, but I personally don't think that it's going to be as big a piece of it as uh, one might like when you look at the end result of it, right? You had a question back there. Yeah, after ride sharing, what's the number one thing a consumer can do to help the global economy progress also? You mean you know, do, after ride sharing? Yeah. The single biggest thing you could do? Yeah. As a consumer or as a society? Just consumer. As a consumer, wow. Uh, use mass transit if you have it. But the problem, this is why I said as a society, um, I grew up in a country in Italy where public transportation is the norm. Um, and uh, it is absolutely possible in any major city to go somewhere using public transit. You tried that in Columbus. Um, I would drive, I go to Detroit very frequently to visit the auto companies. I would do it by train <clears throat> rather than driving my car if I could, but Columbus doesn't have a train station. And if I got to, Detroit does, but if I get to the Detroit train station, how do I go to Dearborn from there? What do we do, rent a car? So I think that it's a combi consumer choice is to some extent enabled by larger societal choices. And different um, societies, call them countries if you want, have make different decisions about uh, uh, what to invest in. And so you travel in Europe and you find that uh, uh, public transit is uh, capillary and works really well. So there, citizens have a choice. We in Columbus, ride sharing, I mean, I think the way you presented it is very good. Beyond ride sharing, what can we do? In Columbus, not much. That's my, I, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on this. Sure, you could ride the bicycle if that's vi viable for you. Telecommuting? Telecommuting, well, sure, of course, but it's not always possible, right. South Dakota compared to, to justify a Tesla? <laughs> Let me put it this way. Ohio is improving rapidly, 
as, <laughs> as natural gas displaces coal. But I think you understand from the local geography here that uh, we are in coal country. Or actually, we are not in coal country here. All you have to do is drive about 60 miles, OK? So uh, <laughs> now, Ohio is pretty, it was very heavy coal. Um, when we started our studies on uh, uh, electric and plug-in uh, hybrid vehicles in 2008, at that time, Ohio was 85%, Ohio electricity was 85% coal. Um, however, today with natural gas, I think things are changing and because of the low price of fuel, the investment strategies of the electric power companies are changing. It's a tough, you know, how much do you want to pay for your electricity? You know, this is ultimately, you know, I would pay more for cleaner electricity, but I don't think that our society at large is there yet. Okay. Now, in some uh, countries in Europe, in Sweden, uh, in uh, Germany, there actually are differential uh, pricing uh, schemes for electricity, uh, depending on how it's produced. So, um, I admit I'm a chemist. The, wh why is uh, natural gas so much more energy efficient? It's not energy efficient. It has lower CO2 emissions. Right. Because so it's CH4. So just it, from the water? From, that, from those extra two hydrogens making the water, that's all it is? So what happens is that um, um, when you are, uh, a, the chemical reaction that we call combustion r involves uh, a, a, the mm, a, reacting a hydrocarbon fuel. Gasoline is something like, gosh, now I don't, it's something like, uh, you C8 know, C, C8, say that again, C8 H. Yeah, C8 to C12, right. And diesel is a little more C. So what happens is that for a given amount of fuel and air, you combine them at a certain air fuel ratio for gasoline is about 14.7 parts uh, moles of air per fuel, okay? So that 14.7 to one results in a certain amount of CO2 emissions. If you do the, what we call the stoichiometric air fuel ratio for combustion for CH4, the amount of CO2 produced is about 25% lower than gasoline. It's because of the carbon content of the fuel being lower. Okay. That's it, it's as simple as that. Lower carbon content. And in the extreme, he was talking about hydrogen. Well, if you take the C out, what you have is hydrogen and there is no CO2. But you can't go lower than, than natural gas and it still has CO2 emissions, okay? The distribution of what? Ethics. In what sense? So if a car has to make a decision whether to hit, Probably possibly kill a person or save the driver. Yeah, save the driver. Like what, what is? Like who, right, who right. So how much intelligence? OK, so if we start getting into the ethical and legal problems of autonomous vehicles, <laughs> we will not leave tonight, OK? <laughs> We're here to stay. You bring up a very important problem, and that's why I said earlier, vehicles in the future will be autonomous part of the time, in, or will have total autonomy part of the time, or partial autonomy most of the time. But I think that a completely autonomous vehicle uh, brings up a lot of questions, right? Uh, about uh, how do you trust? I mean, gosh, you know, we had recalls for faulty ignition switches. I mean, can you imagine with an autonomous vehicle? So the auto industry is preparing for it. And the way they're, they're approaching it is by having in, an increasing degree of, of autonomy in different functions. I'll give you an example that you can understand immediately. In, in, in the Take uh, what is called adaptive cruise control, OK? This is now a cruise control feature in which you have a radar in the front of the car. And you set yourself for 70 miles per hour. But there is a, if there is a car in front of you, it'll know that, and it'll back off to keep a safe distance between, between you and the car in front of you. Well, that's an autonomy feature. Today, there are even uh, features that will do some amount of braking and steering for you in late model vehicles that are being produced now, where if it's clear that you're going off the road and you're going to kill yourself or you're going to hit something, they'll actually do some of the braking and steering for you. But the ethics of it and the legal aspects are very complicated. So I don't know. I still tend to steer my car by myself. And, <laughs> yeah. Yes? Your presentation today is about uh, mega cities and transportation in mega cities. Uh, I was wondering, for Columbus, a very small city, do you have any recommendations like for the public transportation? For example, 
I tried to take the public transportation from Clintonville just to downtown. It takes like 40 minutes. Yeah, understood. While driving can be way less. Yeah. So, so, so here. Okay. Dakota, yeah. Like, for example, I know there was a proposition for a train. Uh, but that would only serve a corridor up and down yeah, High Street. Right. I'm with you. So, to develop a capillary transportation system from scratch is an incredible expense that today no city the size of Columbus could imagine being able to put forth. So here's my simple answer to you. I think that we have the technology today to create a ride sharing program and some of these, there are already experiments in this direction, where you basically have an app on your phone and you say I am here and I want to go there, okay? Can I ride with you? And, and then you pay some amount. Technolo from a technology perspective, we can do it today. I mean, the phone I have in my pocket is perfectly capable of doing that. It's a it's society that needs to change its mindset to think about the fact that collectively, I might spend an extra two minutes because I stop to pick you up or I make an extra detour to drop you off where you want to go. But collectively, if we all thought that way, the global composite benefit for, would be fantastic. And that's something that could be made to work because there are cars going all over the place all the time. Okay. Maybe we should learn how to be in less of a hurry too, but that's another. That's <laughs> a, but but I, I agree with you that you know, from Clintonville to here, 40 minutes by public transit, it's ridiculous. It's not practical. Do you think it's more feasible to do something like connecting just the major cities? For, I'll give you another example. For example, I want to fly somewhere. I found that like, if I fly from Cincinnati, it is way cheaper. It's going to save me money. But then I think about driving up there, parking up there, and then I was like, no, probably I'm going to end up like flying from Columbus. Like, I feel like there's lots of advantages, you know, for us as, so for example, Americans, uh, I know everybody like, you know, likes to travel, and uh, uh, I feel like, you know, we're always mm -hmm. into cars. Yeah. Uh, and you know, you came from Europe where like, all Europe is connected via, right. you know, the train and buses, and you can go across country. Do you see that as, as more feasible, connecting like major cities? I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. Yes, I think the connections between major cities are, uh, are very important, and there are different uh, means of transportation. We'll get to you, don't worry. Uh, there are different means of transportation for different directions. So here's what happens. In this country, we have a lot of democracy and uh, um, you know, personal opinions going around, and it's a free country, and we do things the way we do. Other countries operate differently. For example, China is a much more centralized government that makes decisions for its people. What the government of China has decided is that medium range distances uh, between cities are covered by high speed trains. So if you go from Beijing to Shanghai, for example, you are in for about a four hour train ride, very comfortable by the way, and if you fly when you think about uh, security checks and all that, it takes about the same time. You're much more comfortable on the train. Uh, anything that is uh, within two hours, there is no question that it's much better done on the train. And by the way, much faster than cars because those trains go about 300 kilometers an hour, okay? So, uh, and then for longer distances, the airplane is the way to, to go. And locally in city, there is the network of public transportation, subways. Now, why can China do this? Uh, uh, so efficiently, it's trying as hard as it can, population is huge, okay, because China is starting anew today and it's making its investments uh, in a centralized manner. This country has had transportation for a long time and so it's difficult to sort of change patterns and habits, but I think that there are optimal ways of transporting people from one place to the next. The problem is that the cost of the infrastructure is something that is untenable today. You wanted to add to the, this, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask a different question. Okay. Uh, given the political and regulatory implications of automotive, or sorry, automated cars, how do you see this impacting the automotive industry and competitors such as Chrysler and GM? How do you think uh, that that'll play out over the next 20, 30 years? So I think that, first of all, the auto companies, they are competitors, but they know how to be partners as well. Uh, and when it comes to regulatory issues, and there is no question that uh, uh, regulatory affairs will play a prominent role in everything that has to do with autonomous vehicles, as they have in things that have to do with fuel consumption and emissions, okay? Um, the auto companies have a way of uh, um, working together to help establish standards and to basically help 
help advance the technology collectively if it's something that is going to be uh, <coughs> applicable in general to all of them. So there will always be competition, of course, but in the end, if just like uh, uh, it took government regulations to make emission controls okay, in vehicles, it started in California uh, in the, actually the late 1960s. And what that caused was the Environmental Protection Agency and uh, emissions regulations, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the auto companies got smart pretty quickly. They started working together because this is something they had to do. And so uh, there is quite a bit of collaboration in that area. With autonomy, I see the same trend. <clears throat> that is, on issues that have to do with safety, security, for example, there is a concept in my line of work that we call functional safety in control systems and in software. How do you ensure that when you design the electronic control systems and the software that runs them for everything in the vehicle, anything that has a safety implication, anti-lock brake systems, electronic throttle control, and so on, how do you ensure that you have maximum reliability in, in the overall system? Well, there are functional safety standards, and these are things that the auto company enforces in a shared manner with their suppliers. So, you know, the auto guys are not so bad. They're pretty good people, after all, and they give us cars that are pretty nice to drive today. So, I think uh, Vince is sending me the signal that we're done. So, fantastic questions. Thank you.